This is the JCC housing. And in this area, there's actually a ball bearing underneath this spring plate. And if you look carefully, you can see some reflections there. And that's some grease I just placed in there to make sure that lubrication stays there. This is the JCC lens where it sits in the guard. And you notice there's a flat space here on the shaft and there's a similar one on the other side. What happens is this spring plate sits on the flat spot and once the plate presses in place here it tends to center on that flat spot and so it flips over and then the other side of the flat spot holds it in position and that should end up so that the lens is approximately flat in place once it's fully assembled. The angle of the spring can be bent or adjusted using uh, optical pliers, needle nose type optical pliers if necessary but usually the factory adjustment works So, JCC detail, if you look inside this space, there's actually a white washer right at the bottom of that. That fits between the um, housing and this guard that rotates, and uh, dirt collects under it, over it, around it, and what it typically uses oil to help dissolve the, the dirt and then I can lift it out with tissues so typically I put three in one oil in this space and then it usually takes me two hands to agitate this but uh, what I try to do is lift this up It is indeed hard to grip with this one set of fingers. But by agitating up and down, you can see that you can start getting bubbles forming there, and that means that the oil is seeping in and air is seeping out. And that um, allows the oil to get under the washer and eventually to come out in this space, and that'll also soften the grease if it's a sort of a dried grease situation. So you, you move this around, you stuff a tissue in there, you try to soak up any dirt that you, you've got around in there. And I guess from this angle you can see there's either dirt on or under the washer. And you try to clean the area out there, out in that area the best you can, using oil, tissues, and agitation. This exterior knob is secured by an Allen screw. Once it's removed, it's possible to adjust the axis tension. This is a 3 8 inch hex nut, which is a lock nut. Once you back off this nut, this is another nut underneath it, which has a slot on both sides. And so once you loosen up this nut, you can then tighten it clockwise or loosen it counterclockwise if the axis tension is either too tight or too loose. It's too loose if when you flip the JCC out, the axis shifts. It's too tight when it's just too hard to turn and, and the doctor would get fatigued doing that all day. So that's how you adjust that. And so you can hold this with a little screwdriver while you put a like a nut driver a hex head nut driver over this um, lock nut and you can tighten it while you hold this as with most of these things there's a flat spot on the shaft and you line up the uh, set screw on that flat spot as you reassemble it This auxiliary knob is secured by a Torx 
set screw, which is inside that hole. Similarly, this three adapter, this knob that controls the three adapter lens changes on the sphere is tightened by a, a Torx screw as well. So there's a flat spot on the shaft there, and there's a flat spot on, um, on this shaft, and you always line up the flat spot when you tighten the set screw. So these are two tips. This um, one on the left is a Torx T5 size. And it's different from a hex, which has six flat sides. This actually has six points to the um, to the screw, to the um, head of the um, wrench. And the um, screw it fits into has a similar sort of star six point star shape pattern. So this is the sill glide lubricant as it comes out of the tube. As you can see, quite firm and solid. Now what I try to do with um, mixing sill glide with um, three-in-one oil is figuring out how much three-in-one oil to add to the sill glide and sort of whip it up. Um, I use this. sort of a short chopstick and just sort of whip back and forth, drip in more three-in-one. Um, if I make it too loose, uh, I can always add more sill glide, but um, it's just a matter of dripping enough three-in-one oil, like 20, 30, sometimes 40 drops with a little glob of, uh, a big glob of uh, sill glide. It's, it's all trying to get a consistency. Um, that won't be quite so viscous so that the bearings move more smoothly when, it's, when the ferropter is reassembled. So this is the inside of the cylinder assembly. As you can see here, four lenses. There's actually two, two sets of four lenses one moves behind the other. So there's a quarter adapter increment and adapter quarter increment and they interlock together to give us all the powers. Now the way the uh, lenses advance is there's actually these little pegs. There's actually four short pegs and one longer peg. The longer peg moves both groups together. The shorter peg just moves the group on the bottom, which is actually the quarter adapter increment. I've only had one occasion in the last 12 years of 100 ferropters each year that one of these pegs has dislodged. And what that what ended up happening is the long peg dislodged, so it never advanced to the higher power cylinder. It went um, quarter adopter increments up to one adopter and then start over quarter adopter up to increments up to one adopter and it was going nowhere even though the, the dial on the front would say one and a quarter it, it was actually zero because the uh, adopter and a quarter lens didn't advance and then when it said um, when it said one and a half it was actually back to a quarter so it, it wasn't working refractively because of that malfunction and I sent it in, had the, I probably could have just glued the peg back in, but I really didn't know how it was attached. So I sent it back into Lombard Instruments and they repaired it for 150 bucks plus shipping both ways. So that's what it costs for some of this stuff. There's uh, one of these little wheels that interlocks to help it stay in position for the adapter and a quarter one, and then there's a, a little one that helps the the wheel here click into place, which holds the the other lens in position at uh, quarter adapter increments. So 
so with most of the Phoroptera still uh, assembled here, you can visualize to a certain extent how this small wheel drops into a space on the edge of the core adapter sphere wheel. You can actually see the dimple here, which reappears every quarter of a revolution. And that's how it controls the position of where the lens lines up in the aperture. Now once I remove the uh, three slotted screws here from this uh, power plate, I'll then be able to access the internal hub which holds the sphere wheels in place. So with the uh, power plate removed, it then exposes the central hub and that's secured by the central lock nut. Once the, this is a T5 um, set screw in the middle and once that's loosened then the surrounding nut can be removed and then the central hub can be lifted off. So again there's this little notch in the central hub which fits into a small peg at the bottom and then the plate, the power plate, screws into these three holes. And This is what locks the power of the underlying section into the displayed power plate. So this is the power plate for the core adopter sphere increments and this peg and this notch lock the three adopter lens wheel from below into the power plate. Now the bearing is a frame which holds all these little cylinders and as the two wheels rotate past each other these cylinders then roll. And one of the reasons of having the, the grease not too viscous is because you've got the resistance of all that thick goo making these cylinders harder to turn. And so I try to get it as thin as reasonable but not liquid because liquid then it flows outwards and downwards and gets onto the lens and all around here and it just makes a big mess. So this is called the Geneva assembly. This controls the auxiliary wheel rotation with the gear on the, on the underside. This peg and these tips are designed to advance the three doctor um, sphere wheel. These little um, grooves fit into the pegs. Then, when the sphere wheel, the quarter doctor sphere wheel, gets to a certain position. It fits into this mechanism so that it moves forward by one lens position when these pins and pegs hit this little feet mechanism. And then when it goes around again another time, it pushes the next foot forward, which moves it forward by one lens unit again. So with the Phoropter now partially reassembled, this is the zero point where all the openings are clear. Uh, if you go qu forward by quarter unit increments into minus, you can go four clicks. Then the fifth click, what it does is it activates the Geneva assembly. And you'll see how 
these pieces rotate, and what's, what's happening is it's moving the underlying lens wheel with that rotation. And when you back up, it puts it back in position, and then four clicks, you're back to an opening. Now, if you go seven clicks into plus, the same arrangement happens. The back side of, of this lens wheel picks up the Geneva assembly, and that causes the underlying wheel to roll forward by one lens increment. And this then repeats every three diopters every time that set of pins reaches this point and activates the Geneva assembly. And so you can go continuously like this without really having to think about when the two wheels are going to move together. When Ferropters first came out, they didn't have this Geneva assembly, and what would happen is there'd be little marks on the side here, and you'd have two sets of lens wheels, and when the lines lined up, like the red marks lined up, you had to remember, okay, at this point, I have to move both wheels simultaneously to make this work. Now, that's tough enough if you can think clearly about it. It's even worse if you're working in a dark room, which typical eye, typically eye exams are, are done in. So with this all happening automatically, you don't have to go through all the additional concentration and work. If you want to make a three diopter increment change, you can do that by rotating the three diopter knob. And so with the three diopter knob in place, you can actually rotate it by three diopter increments if you want to. And that only moves the underlying three diopter lens wheel. <clears throat> but it automatically advances with this design. Now this um, frock design has been out for over 40 years. However, 40 years ago when I was first starting uh, getting familiar with optometry practice, well maybe 38 years ago, um, some of the phoropters did not have this feature. This is called a synchronized cross cylinder. When you turn the axis by 30 degrees, it also turns the JCC by 30 degrees, but it used to be that you would first turn the axis and then turn the JCC and then turn the axis to another position and then turn the JCC to that matching position. And um, still 35 years ago, I would run across phoropters that did not have the synchronized cross-cylinder setup. So this is commonly present in essentially all phoropters nowadays, but it was not always the case. And people just sort of take this for granted and really wouldn't know how to, to do a, a JCC test if, um, if it weren't synchronized. It would, they couldn't figure out what's happening because they turn this and well, the JCC is not lined up anymore. But now it's all automatic with the cross, synchronized cross cylinder because there's all these gears inside of here that connect these two parts together, which again makes it much more complicated if, if something goes wrong in there. You need to send it into an expert servicing place that knows how to put it back together properly. So this is my cleaning setup. These are um, four lenses I just cleaned. And this is an opening. These are the lenses I've not cleaned. Now these are lenses that I actually scrubbed with soap and water. And this is how they look with indirect lighting. So the plus and minus three diopter spheres, which I've already cleaned. And then the uh, quarter diopter minus ones I've already cleaned. And then the quarter diopter plus ones I have not cleaned. I didn't scrub the uh, cylinder lenses, which don't look bad. I mean, there's some dust stuff on them, but uh, 
some terrible, some not terrible. And the JCC, which of course needs some cleaning in the Grizzly. And while I'm doing this, I've got a fan that's blowing towards the lenses to help speed evaporation. And I've got a TV that's uh, playing in the background. Mainly I listen to it um, and occasionally glance at the screen. But uh, mainly it's to keep me from going stir crazy, um, cleaning lens after lens for hours and hours each day. And additionally, some of the cleaning supplies, uh, this is running empty, but this is a little bit of uh, glass plus. This is, this is an alcohol bottle I just stored in. Um, glass plus, Q-tips, and magnifying glass. So I grab a Q-tip, dip it in here, wipe the lens. Q-tip, dip it in there, flip it around, dry with the other side. So it goes on and on for hours.